So love is obviously the theme of the morning. And the Apostle Paul, he encourages this in Philippians 1 in the message translation. Why don't you guys read this out loud with me? We don't do that often in church, but this should be interesting. We'll see. Paul says this. He says, so this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Turn to someone next to you and say, not sentimental gush. (laughs) All right, keep going. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus would be proud of, bountiful and fruits from the soul. Guys, that has been my prayer as your pastor for the last three weeks of this series. This is what I've been praying for you guys, that this would be what your love life and your relationships and your marriage would be marked by. In the opening week of this series, we we talked about what are the ingredients to to make a relationship that lasts. We came back last Sunday and we we talked about how to have a marriage makeover and what God can do to, to resurrect maybe a dead relationship. Today, I want to talk about how God wants to see your love continue to grow and to see your love continue to bloom. Because here's the crazy thing, is that relationships are never standing still. Relationships are either growing closer together or further apart, but a relationship is never stagnant. It's never staying still. It's always getting better or getting worse. So that's what we're going to dive into today. So why don't you guys say happy Valentine's Day to three people and then grab a seat. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, guys. If you're joining us online later in the week, thank you for being a part of our family online. And a happy Valentine's Day to you, even though it's probably not Valentine's Day when they're watching. Exactly, exactly. Well, hey, I mentioned on the first week of this series that Cheryl and I will have been married for 19 years this summer. It's been the best 15 years of our lives. But, but, but this is what I've learned in those 19 years of marriage. I've learned this. I learned this in the very first year of being married, that, that when we got married, my waistline grew automatically, but my relationship did not. Come on, come on. Anyone that struggles real, right? Come on, come on. Like, like I, I gained some, some newlywed weight. I don't know if it's like, I remember in college, it was like the freshman 15 or the freshman 5. I had like the newlywed 50. I don't know. Um, yeah, exactly. Whoa, it's right. Like, it's like uh, I went from being single and not eating to like home cooking, and I'm like, yeah. Um, so my waistline grew automatically, but our relationship did not. And, but we think it's going to be that way. We, we, we think that we're going to say, I do. We're going to walk down the aisle together, and our love is just going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And the reality is that's not the way that it works, that a relationship takes skill. It takes wisdom. It takes knowledge. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of forgiveness and a lot of work. Marriage is what you make of it. You get out of your marriage what you put into your marriage. And so if you will put in the, learn, learn the skills and, and find knowledge and wisdom and put in the effort and, and offer forgiveness, then, then you can have the kind of love the Apostle Paul talks about here in the verse that we just read together. But that does not happen automatically. And it doesn't happen from just praying about it. Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Christians for a second, okay? Can we pick on some Christians today? Let's pick on some Christians. Christians drive me crazy when they talk about how they're praying for their marriage. Oh, Pastor Brian, I'm praying about it. I'm just praying about it. I'm praying about it. Well, are you doing anything? No. But I'm praying about it, right? Well, I got news for you, honey. Jesus is not going to do something unless you're doing something too, okay? It's not going to get better automatically. It's not going to get better. Love's not going to grow just by praying about it. So without a lot of introduction today, I just want to kind of dive into this because here's what I believe. I believe that, that God wants to take some relationships today and he wants to do a transformation and he wants to bless some relationships today no matter what you guys have been through up until this point. I truly believe that. I believe that he is here. I believe that he is able. I believe that he is powerful and that he's able to do something in your relationship that maybe up until this point has not been a reality. So here's what I want you to do. It's Valentine's Day, so humor me, okay? Show me some love. Take some notes today. Take some notes today because this is what I've learned. You lose 40% of everything that you hear or read within 24 hours. 
which makes what I do for a living absolutely pointless sometimes, right? It's like I slave and work so hard on a message, and then I realize that once you guys leave, you've already forgotten 40% of it. Oh, geez, right? But this is what I also found. This is interesting. A whole study I found on this, that if you will take notes, you can recall almost 100% of everything that you heard or something that you read. So humor me today. It's Valentine's Day. Show me some love. Take your service guide out and write some of these things down. Because as you go throughout the pages of Scripture, there are some some basic insights that God gives us from his word of how love grows. The, The love is not something that just happens once and then it continues to grow. These are the things that we have to cultivate in order for love to grow in our lives. So if you get if you're ready for this, say I'm ready. All right. Number one is this. Keep paying attention. Keep paying attention. Don't be elbowing your spouse right now, but keep, keep paying attention. Under that, you might write this. This is how I put it in my notes, is that attention equals love. Attention equals love. The most loving thing that you can do for someone is to give them your attention, because when you give someone your attention, what are you giving them? You're giving them your time. Amen? You're giving them your time, and your time is the one thing you will never get more of in this life. You can get more money, you can get a new job. <laughs> Sometimes you can get a new family. But the, 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 sorry, the, 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 the one thing that you can't do, right? Come on. The one thing you can't do is get more time. When you give your attention to someone, you are giving them your time, the most precious thing you have. You're saying to them, I value you. You matter to me. You are worth this investment of, of my time. And the truth is, this is how you fell in love. This is how you fell in love. You know how you fell in love? Is that you began to pay attention to someone and they began to pay attention to you. That's how it worked. It's not that complicated. You paid attention to them and they paid attention to you and that's how you guys are in a a relationship today. We even use phrases like this. We use phrases like, oh, oh man, she caught my eye. What does that mean? She, She caught your what? She caught your attention. That when you give someone your attention and they give their attention to you, that that is the building block for a relationship. Come on. Think back to when you guys were dating. Or think back to when you were engaged. Think about how much time and attention you guys gave to each other. It's sickening, isn't it? Think, think about that. Like you, you guys were always together. If, you, if one of you was still living at home, your parents were like, I don't like this boy. You're never around anymore, right? Or, or I don't like this girl. She's taking you away from us. And that's the point. <laughs> You guys were always together. Sorry. You, you, guys, you guys were always together. You, you guys like, you wrote letters and notes. Remember that? Writing notes to each other. You wrote notes. You wrote cards. You read poetry together. Uh, you spent all this. You, you, you talked on the phone for like hours. What did you guys talk about? I have no idea, but we talked for hours. Now fast forward to today, and what is it like? How was your day? <laughs> right? Uh, like... Our our spouse is no longer the focus of our attention. Where at one point in our lives, your fiancé, the person you're going to marry, that was all that you thought about. You woke up in the morning and you thought about them. You went to bed at night and you thought about them. Now, they're not the center of your life anymore. And, And you take things for granted and you don't pay as much attention because, let's be honest, now you've got bills, babies, and budgets. You got the three B's, right? You got bills, babies, and budgets, and you're focused on all these things. And I'm guilty of this too. You're guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. All I'm simply trying to say is this, is that the moment that we begin to focus on something else, the relationship begins to deteriorate because a relationship is never a stagnant thing. Your relationship may feel stagnant, but it's not. It's either getting better or it's, it's getting worse. So, so let's start here. Maybe this will be a way of kind of introducing this idea in a way that we can understand. So, ladies, I want to let you in on a little secret about us guys. Le- <laughs> the side of the room apparently is not ready for this. Um, all right, so, so I'm going to let you know a little secret about your man. Because, ladies, listen to me. Until you understand this about your guy, your relationship will never make sense to you why it feels the way it does sometimes. Men, by nature, we are goal-oriented. This is the way that God has wired us as men. We are warriors. We are hunters. We have a goal. We have a hill to climb. And we're going to climb that hill. And we're going to conquer. And we're not going to rest until we do it. Let me give you an example of let me, let me give you an example of what this looks like. When you guys go on a family vacation, 
As a guy, we have a goal. We're going to get to our destination, and we are going to drive, 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 drive until we get there, and we're not going to have any fun until we get there because when we get there, the goal of this is to have fun, so that's when we'll have fun. And the, the woman's like, oh, let's just enjoy the journey. Nonsense, right? So, so I, I, as a guy, like you're getting up at 4 a.m. to pack the car. You're trying to rush the kids in because you got to beat the traffic. You got to get there by such and such a time, and you're going to get your most bang for your buck out of this trip. And two things are going to be true when your kids get in the car. You say, kids, two things are true: the gas tank is going to be full, and your bladders are going to be empty. And we're going to drive and drive and drive until the gas tank is empty and your bladders are full. God help the kid that his bladder is full before the gas tank is empty. Amen. But th this is how guys work. This is how guys <laughs> operate, is that we are goal-oriented. So women understand this, that when a, a guy wakes up one day and realizes, hey, there's something missing in my life, I need to get married. So as a guy, you now have a what? You have a goal, and a guy is focused on that goal, and I'm going to find me a wife. And guys in this stage of their life will do almost anything. Guys get really creative, and they're writing poetry, and they don't play the guitar, but they learn three chords to make you think they can play the guitar, and they're singing songs to you. And, and it's, like, it's like all of this amazing stuff that guys don't do any other point in their entire life. Then the wedding happens. You guys walk down the aisle together, and the moment you say, I do, and you guys go on the honeymoon, you get back from the honeymoon, and something has clicked inside of your husband's brain. You know what happened? Check. <laughs> and he's not being selfish, and he's not being a jerk. He's just being a guy. Because as men, we are goal-oriented. We realize, okay, I got the wife. Check. What's next? Oh, shoot. I have to provide for this woman. I pledged the rest of my life to her. That's a long time. I better get to work. <laughs> and so we get to work, and we start working, and we're working. Why are we working? To provide, right? To provide for our spouse. And the focus, though, shifts. Even though it's still coming from a place of love, our focus shifts from undivided attention to provision. And men, this is what we don't realize, is our wives are over here thinking that it's just going to be more of the same, like all this stuff you did back when you were engaged and all lovey-dovey and all the, the poetry and you learned the three chords and the guitar and you're playing songs for her and, and the long walks on the beach. She thinks that's just going to continue going once you're married. And so now she's like, what happened? What, what, what happened? I feel so isolated. I feel so alone. I feel like all you care about is your job. And for a guy, we're over here like, I don't understand you. I'm working to provide for you. Don't you know I'm doing this because I love you? Do you think I like this job? Not really. I'm doing this to provide for you and for our future family. But guys, this is what we miss, okay? To your wife, I show I care by staying aware. The way that you show your, you care is by staying aware. And if we don't learn how to pay attention and to give attention to each other, then again, our relationship is going to begin to crumble. Three of the biggest enemies to paying attention to each other are pride, presumption, and preoccupation. Pride says this. Pride says, I already know everything I need to know anyway. I don't need your input. <laughs> presumption says, I already know what you're going to say anyway, so I don't need to listen to you. And preoccupation is just being so busy with, with life that the only time you stop is when you want to say something, not when they want to tell you something. You don't listen to them. You don't pay attention. So God gives us the antidote to this. And James 1.19 says this. says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I think all of our politics right now should have this like permanently memorized. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know what's crazy about that? If you do the first two parts of that verse, the last part's automatic. If we would be what? If we would be quick to listen and slow to speak, we would become slow to become angry, and our relationship would be able to keep attention and pay attention to each other in a way that it would continue to grow and continue to flourish. You got to learn how to pay attention, right? I show I care by staying aware. Say that out loud. I show I care by staying aware. Say that again. I show I care by staying aware. All right. Number two is this. Write this down. Keep making adjustments. Keep making adjustments adjustments. Because over the years, circumstances are going to cause you to have all different kinds of things you're going to have to adjust for and around. 
You guys are going to move at some point. Your kids are going to grow up at some point. Hopefully, they leave the house at some point, <laughs> right? You guys are going to go through different jobs. Possibly even illness is a reason to have to adjust. But here's what we have to understand is because circumstances are constantly changing and we're constantly having to adjust, but we're adjusting as two imperfect people. There's no such thing as two perfect people adjusting perfectly. You have two imperfect people trying to adjust imperfectly to the different circumstances of life. And this is why we need to offer grace to our mate. This is why we have to live a life of grace. We have to extend the same kind of grace that Jesus offered us. We have to extend that to our spouse. If you look at the way that, that Jesus offers grace to you and extends grace to you, there's some things that we can learn. One of the things that we learn from Jesus is to put someone else's needs above your own. Jesus came and lived his life on this earth and did not do anything for himself. No, what did he do? He says, I'm not here about my agenda. I'm here to please the Father. No, no, you know why he came? He came for you. He put your agenda above his agenda to the point that it even cost him his life on the cross. This is our model. And so we can model that, and we can put someone else's agenda above our own. The Apostle Paul, taking what he knew about Jesus and applying it to the early church, says this in Philippians 2. He says, look out for one another's interest and not just your what? Not just your own. He says you got to look out for other people and not just your own. Because here's the crazy thing. Come on. The longer you're married, the less you pay attention to each other. The longer you're married, the less we think about the needs of the person laying across the bed from us, which is so crazy. It seems so backwards. I had a, a couple one time that I married, and they were off on their honeymoon, and, and, and she had this weird thing about being a newlywed, didn't want people to like, be looking at them weird and paying extra attention to them. So she said to her husband, she's like, you know what, let's just pretend like we're not newlyweds. And so they, they, they get to the resort, they pull in, he gets out of the car and goes walking in, and she's like, aren't you going to get the bags? And he's like, no, you get them. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that that the longer that we're married, that's fictitious, by the way. Uh, why, why is it that the longer that we're married, the less we pay attention to each other? This is why Scripture comes along and, and, and offers us a different model. Scripture comes along and says you've got to look out for the interests of others and not just your own. It's a, it's a different standard. We have to keep making adjustments for the other person so that we can put what they want above what we want. And that's what this is, what this is all about. Another way you can make an adjustment is to submit to each other. To submit to each other. Ooh, there's a big, dirty word. To, to submit to each other. So I can give up what I want so that someone else can have what they want. The Apostle Paul, again, in Ephesians 5 says this. He says, honor Christ by submitting to each other. Now, I, I know there's some, some, some guys, maybe not in our church, but there's, there's some guys in, in churches somewhere this morning that think, hey, Pastor Brian, uh, uh, I'm the guy. That means I'm supposed to be like the spiritual leader of the home, right? Well, yes, throughout Scripture, you can see that God puts a, a different mantle of responsibility upon the husband, yes. Well, doesn't that mean then, that, uh, Pastor Brian, that my wife's supposed to do whatever I tell her? Okay, bro. Um, uh, first of all, n n no. Yes, you are the spiritual leader, but do you know what a leader means? A leader means you go first. That's what a leader is. A boss is someone that tells you what to do. A leader is someone that goes first and shows the way and sets the tempo for the relationship and sets the tempo for the family. And so what, what Paul is saying is, hey, as the guy, you're going to lead the way in making adjustments. You're going to be on the forefront of this. Paul goes on in the rest of Ephesians 5 and says this. He says, husbands, love your wives. This is from the Amplified uh, Translation of the Bible. Husbands, love your wives. And then the, the, the notation is seek the highest good for her. And surround her with a caring, unselfish love, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul is telling us that we have to be willing to adjust to meet the other person's needs. That requires adjustment. It requires adjustment. And as men, we lead the way in our sacrifice. And this is going to happen in the big things in life. There's going to be some big things, guys, where you have to lay down what you want for what they want. But let me tell you where this really makes a difference. It's in the everyday things. And the little bitty dailies. This is where you go into work a little bit later or come home a little bit earlier because she needs you. This is, this is where you, you watch what they want to watch on TV. Come on. 
This is where you watch the movie that they want to watch. This is where you go to the restaurant that they want to go to. You don't like that kind of food, but you go there because they want to. This is where, come on, come on. This is where you listen to them when they need you to listen to them, not when you have time to listen to them. Oh, that's good. Let me say that again. This is where you listen to them when they need you to listen to them, not when, okay, baby, I've got five minutes, go. No, 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 no. You see, here's the test of what true love is. True love is not what you say, it's in what you do. That's the test of true love. It's not in the words that you say, it's in the actions that you perform. It's in your patience with annoyances. It's with becoming more forgiving. It's giving up on some of your fantasies of the way that you thought marriage would be and embracing and being thankful for the marriage that you do have. It's, it's putting the best interest of your spouse above your own. It's doing what Romans 15, 5 talks about. Paul says, may God who gives patience and steadiness and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other, each with the what? Each with the what? Oh, come on, say that bold part with me. Each with the what? The attitude of Christ toward the other. If we would adopt his way of thinking, it would change your marriage. If we would adopt his attitude, it would change our marriage. All right, that was number two. Number three is this. Keep showing affection. Keep showing affection. We're going to pay attention. We're going to make adjustments, and we're going to show affection. Attention, adjustments, affection. Attention, adjustments, and affection. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter 12. Again, Paul writes this. He says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. You know what's crazy? It's so much easier to fall in love than it is to stay in love. Amen? (laughs) You know what's required of falling in love? You know how you fall in love? Everyone take your finger and put it on your wrist right here. You feel that? You feel that? That's called a pulse. That's all that's required. That's all you need to fall in love right there. You have fallen in love with people on a TV screen you've never met. Come on, right? All that's needed is a pulse. You know what's needed for marriage and for love to last? You need a plan. All you need to fall in love is a pulse, but to have a marriage that lasts, you need a plan. So what do you do when the feelings aren't there anymore? What do you do when the spark and the love and the romance just isn't there the way that it used to? I want to suggest something maybe a little bit that may seem bizarre to you. If you're in that position where the feelings aren't there anymore and the love is gone and the romance is gone, I would suggest doing what Jesus told the church in Laodicea to do in the book of Revelation. He he told the the church in Laodicea, he, he says this, he says, you've lost your first love for me and here's how you get it back. And then he gives this advice to a church. This is advice that he gives to a church, but here's what I'm telling you, is that if you will apply what Jesus says to this church, if you apply that to your marriage, I believe you'll see the same thing. If you've lost your first love and you want to get it back, this is the recipe right here. Jesus tells us four things. He says, the love you had at first is gone. The feeling's gone, baby. Remember how far you have fallen. Return to me and change the way you think and the way that you act and do what you did at first. We're going to leave this up for a second because Jesus just gave us four things right here. He says to remember, return, repent, and repeat. He says to remember, to return, to repent, and then to repeat. He says to remember. Jesus is saying, hey, hey, you, you want to fall in love again? Then go back and remember what it was like to be in love. Go back to the way it used to feel. Think about the way you felt about this person. Think about all the, the things you guys did in the good days, and think about how much fun you had and the love you had and all the feelings and that, that, that quiver in the liver, that ocean of emotion. Go back and think about all the ways you used to feel and use that a way, as a way of sparking that feeling again. He says, remember, and then he says to return. To return what? We just talked about this, your attention, your focus. Because you've been focused on your job, and you've been focused on babies and bills and budgets and the stresses of life and COVID and all these other things. You've been focused on all these other things, but if you want to have those feelings again, you got to return your what? you got to return your focus, your attention. So return. Remember, return. And then he says to repent. Repent means to change your mind, to change your thinking. Love is not a feeling. It causes feelings, but love is not a feeling. Well, what is love then, Pastor Brian? Love is a commitment. 
Love is commitment that says, even though I don't feel this way anymore, even though this is not how my feelings feel towards this person right now, I'm going to act like this is how I feel because that is the commitment that I made, and that is what love is. That is to repent. That is to change your thinking. And then finally, he says to, to repeat, to repeat. You got to do the things you did at the beginning. The way you used to act, you got to act that way again. The things you did in the beginning, you got to do those things again. I've said this throughout the series. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. If you're waiting to feel it all again, if you're waiting to feel those warm fuzzies all over again, Satan will make sure you never feel those things again. It's because feelings follow actions. If you will act that way, your feelings will eventually follow the way you've been acting. Here's what I'm saying. What you did to fall in love is what you have to continue to do to stay in love. I expect at least one woman to give me an amen on that one. I got nothing. Let me say that again. What you did to fall in love is what you have to do to stay in love. You got to do the same things. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. And, and listen, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself here, okay? And I, I'm guilty of this as well. No one is going to fight for you guys to... <laughs> No one's going to fight for your attention and affection with each other. Everything and everyone in this culture is going to be pulling at you guys to, to, to pull you apart. There's not going to be someone out there that's pushing you guys together. But yeah, this is what the University of Nebraska they did a study on what makes a fantastic marriage. They discovered that the most common denominator in a marriage that lasts, in a marriage that has affection long into you know, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years later, that still has the emotions. What's the common denominator in one of those marriages? You know what they found? It was time spent together. It, was time, it wasn't anything big and crazy. It was they, they spent a lot of time together. They gave their attention together. They gave their affection together. They held hands. They touched. They had that, that on a regular basis. And listen, I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't how, I care how good of a Christian you are. I don't care how much you pray. If you guys don't spend time together... You're not going to have a good marriage. <laughs> so you're like, well, that stinks because I don't want to spend time with him. Well, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you the way it is. If you want to have the marriage of your dreams, then you're going to have to spend time. So since we're on the topic of affection and spending time together, um, let's just talk about sex, right? Come on, let's just. Anyone want to talk about sex today? Anyone, anyone? Did, did you know that, that sexuality and spirituality are connected? <laughs> that spirituality and sexuality are connected. Christians should have the best sex out there. You can quote me on that. Christians should have the best romance. Uh, the, the Puritans, the people who founded our country, remember the, the Mayflower that came over, Plymouth Rock, all that? The, the Puritans, in our minds, we've been sold this, this bill of goods that the Puritans were like this, these squares and these prudes, and they were sexually repressed because they were so spiritual, right? They were pure, right? It's in the name. They were Puritans, right? They were separate from culture, and they, right, like they, they only did it to procreate. But this is crazy. If you actually study, there's a, there's a guy named Dr. Leland Wright did a, a whole study on this. It's fascinating. But he found out that's the opposite of what was true, that the Puritans actually, because they were so spiritual, because they were so pure, realized that, that intimacy is a gift from God. It is a gift to be treasured, and it is actually, in Puritan thought, a sin to neglect intimacy. In fact, get this. This is Dr. Leland Wright, professor. He, he writes this. He says, if a Puritan wife in New England felt that her husband was neglecting their sex life, she would complain first to her pastor. Please don't ever do that to me. <laughs> so she, she would complain to her pastor and then to the whole church that her husband was avoiding sex. The Puritan church took it so seriously, they proceeded to kick the man out of church membership until he rectified the situation. I was thinking, what if we still did that today? Imagine going to that church, right? Oh, where do you go? I go to Church of the Sun Coast. Oh, that's the place if you don't make love to your wife, they kick you out, right? Yeah, that's, that, that's my church. Anyway, making fun. But you, you, you get my point, right? affection, if we don't continue to have affection, both sexual and non-sexual, your relationship 
the love will not continue to grow. Number four is this. We'll be quick with these last two. Number four is this. Keep giving affirmation. Keep giving affirmation. Every single person here today, every single person watching online later in the week, we were all wired to need affirmation. We all need to be adored. We all need to be affirmed and built up. One of the reasons that you guys are married is because you affirmed each other. And one of your jobs now as a husband, one of your jobs as a wife, is to be your husband or wife's biggest cheerleader. To be the one that rallies them on and makes their dreams come true. Why? Because we live in a world full of cynics and critics, and like it or not, we live in cancel culture. Everywhere you go, there are cynics and critics and people trying to cancel this and cancel that and cancel you and kick you off of this and do that. Listen, we need as a husband or wife to be the cheerleader. One of the greatest things you can do for your spouse, one of the greatest things you can do for your marriage is just to cheer the other person on, to affirm them, to adore them, to do what Hebrews 3.13 says. It says to encourage each other every day. You know how often every day is? Every day. <laughs> it's every day. Encourage each other every day while it is still today. It's a, a daily habit. It's a daily practice. And men, listen, I know we struggle with this, okay? I know we struggle with this. So men, listen to me. It's Valentine's Day. You're in church on Valentine's Day. That's going to be good for you, okay? Now there's a, hold on, hold on. That's going to be good for you. You may have taken some notes. If not, there's time left to take a few notes. That's going to be good for you. But you know what else would be good for you? Is if you would affirm your wife this week. You're like, what do I affirm? You can affirm her value. The word appreciate. Where else do we use the word appreciate? Well, my house right now is appreciating, right? <laughs> like crazy, it's appreciation. It's like you look at Zillow, it's like, oh my gosh, we need to sell this sucker. Holy cow, right? It's, it's what? It's, it's appreciating. Did you know that you can raise the value of another human being's life by affirming them? by adoring them, by, by, by building them up. And I know, I know some guys out there sitting, well, what do I appreciate? I can't think of anything to appreciate, Pastor Brian. Appreciate the fact that she stuck with you, bro. <laughs> like, like, it may not be the marriage that you wanted. She may not be doing the things that you wanted her to do, but guess what? She stuck it out with your sorry butt, right? Like, like she is still there, and you can appreciate the effort. In Proverbs 12, it says, a word of encouragement does wonders. A word of encouragement would do wonders in your relationship this week. I've heard it said, that if you treat your wife like a queen, she'll treat you like a king for the rest of your life. Amen? Okay, maybe not. All right. So you can also affirm their strengths. You can affirm their value. You can affirm their strengths. Our job is to bring out the best in the other person. But this is how we often do it. We, we think the way that we bring the best out of the other person is by pointing out the worst. <laughs> but that never works. You want to know how you bring out the best in someone else? It's by pointing out the best in them. You affirm them. And so you make a decision. I'm going to be a dream builder, not a dream buster. I'm going to be someone who brags about myself. I'm going to give strokes instead of pokes, Right? You, you can, can affirm their strength, and you also can affirm their ministry. So many times we miss this, but you can affirm how you see God using them in the world to make a difference. Affirm their value, affirm their strengths, affirm their ministry. We all need affirmation. Don't take it for granted that just because you told her how you feel in 2008, <laughs> that she still <laughs> remembers that, right? Like, well, I told her I loved her back in 2008, and I hadn't changed my mind yet. Okay. Don't, don't take it for granted. Give your, your affirmation. And the last thing is this, and we'll wrap it up and be done. I've mentioned this every week of the series, but number five, keep following Jesus. Keep following Jesus. Without a doubt, the most important thing that you and your spouse can do is to follow Jesus. In a world that's going to try to pull you guys apart, Jesus is the glue that holds you together. Jesus is that glue. The Apostle Paul tells us this in Corinthians 2. He says, in the same way you receive Jesus our Lord and Messiah by faith, continue, I want to say continue, continue your journey of faith, progressing further into your union with him. Here's the truth of what this teaches. Is that the more you follow Jesus and the closer you get to Jesus, the closer you're going to get to your spouse. The more you progress in your union with Jesus, the more you're going to progress in your union with your spouse. Maybe you've heard this statistic before. You've heard people talk in this way. They say, well, you know what? The Christians just get divorced at the same rate as the secular world. You ever heard that before? Well, well people in church, they, they just get divorced at the same rate as everybody else. I've heard that statistic for years. But you know what the reality is? 
the exact opposite of that. In fact, in a University of Connecticut study, Professor uh, Bradley Wright, a sociologist, he, he found this in his studies. He says that what appears to be intuitive is true. Couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, meaning attend church nearly every week, read the Bibles and spiritual materials regularly, pray privately or together, generally take their faith seriously, not living as perfect disciples, but serious disciples, they enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than the general public. In fact, they found that the divorce rate was up to 40% lower for those who attended church together on a regular basis. Listen to me, that is the difference that Jesus makes. That is the difference that Jesus makes in a relationship, that when as a husband and a wife, you guys are both pursuing Jesus, that the more you get, uh, the more you, you, closer you get to Jesus, the closer you're gonna be together. I said this last week, that Jesus gets along with Jesus. That if Jesus is living in you and Jesus is living with them, then guess what? Jesus gets along with himself. There is no friction there. And I know some of you right now, you're like, you know what, Pastor Brian, I can't even get my spouse to come to church. Uh, others of you t- this morning, you're on the verge of ending your marriage altogether. For some of you, this past year has been a bigger strain on your relationship than anything else that you've gone through. Others of you, you, you may be holding on today, and there's not really any fights going on. Everything kind of seems okay, but the spark is gone. The love is gone. The affection has gone. Listen to me, I I, I don't know how this message lands for you, but I want you to hear there's hope today. I've said this every week of the series, that if God can raise his son from the dead, then he can resurrect your dead marriage. If God in his infinite power, if he can resurrect a dead person from the grave, then don't you believe that he can resurrect your lifeless, dead marriage? And even if nothing changes, listen to me, even if your spouse never comes around, God is able to do more than you could ever ask or imagine in your life and in your heart. Continue to follow Jesus. Continue to follow Jesus. Say that to someone next to you. Continue to follow Jesus. Continue to follow him. Because when things are the darkest, it's when Jesus shines the brightest, amen? Continue to follow Jesus, and the closer you get to him, the closer you'll be to each other. Pray with me. I know sitting through this today may seem like a lot. So here's here's what I want us all to do right now. I want us just to pick one area. Maybe it's attention, maybe it's making adjustments, putting their needs above your own, maybe it's affection, maybe it's affirmation. But, but, but pick just, just one of these. And then I would encourage you where you are right now in your seat, just say, Heavenly Father, I need your help in my marriage. If my marriage is going to grow, I need you. I believe you want my marriage to grow. So help me now. By your grace and power, I will begin with, and you fill in the blank. I'm going to pay more attention to them. I'm going to make adjustments so I can put them above my own needs and wants and desires. I'm going to show them more affection. I'm going to affirm them and build them up. I'm going to be their cheerleader. God, I will begin with blank. And then pray this. Pray, Holy Spirit, be my counselor. Jesus, restore my union with you as you restore our union with each other. Father, I believe you're going to do amazing things in the relationships of this church. I believe that the best is yet to come, that you are not done, that you still have amazing things that we cannot even ask, dream, or imagine. Maybe you walked in today and the purpose of you being here in this moment was not to work on your relationship with your spouse or fiance or boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe the reason you walked in today is because God wanted to work on his relationship with you. Maybe there's never been a moment in your life where you put the welcome mat of your heart out and said, Jesus, I place my hope and faith and trust in you. I've I've tried to live my life independent of you. And I've tried to do things my own way. 
But maybe today something inside you is, is tugging at you and, and, and pulling you and saying, I, I want to know, I want to know God. Like, I, I want to know him. I want to know his son, Jesus. I want to know this amazing love where he was willing to die and sacrifice himself on the cross to pay for my sins and to give me new life and to secure my eternal destiny. If you never said yes to Jesus, that just in your heart and mind, wherever you find yourself sitting right now or watching online, just say something to Jesus like this. Say, Jesus, thank you for coming to rescue me with your life, your death, and resurrection. Forgive me for living such an independent life so far from you. I open my heart and my life to you now. I ask that you come in and be my Lord, my Savior, and my forever friend.